Hello, everyone. This is criminal profiler Pat Brown, and today it's a double header. Uh, I'm going to be talking about two cases uh, the case of Tiffany Valiante and the case of Luis Colmenares. Did I say that right? I think Colmenares. Colmenares, sorry. <laughs> My Spanish just went out the window. Colmenares. Um, uh, this, this, uh, the death of Tiffany occurred in May's Landing in New Jersey, and the death of Luis. Um, took place in Bogota, Colombia. Uh, so, but there's so many similarities in these cases and how they evolved and what's going on even today with the cases that I thought they would be really interesting to analyze together. So first of all, I just want to welcome everybody who is in the chat room. Uh, Alexandra's here, Scarlett's here, Sky Ricky, Emily is here, BLW is here, uh, uh, Stephanie, Lisa's here, I'm probably missing somebody, but everybody's coming in right now. And I just want, I do want to warn you though. Um, I thank you for being here. Uh, it's going to be a very short show today, 20 minutes. I'm going to spend like 10 minutes on this case and 10 minutes on this case. I'm going to get straight to the point and not do too much, you know, you know in-depth analysis or too many of the stories of my own life or my own experiences. <laughs> April Fool's, that'll never happen on this show. <laughs> you know it's gonna be two hours. <laughs> you know? um, I, I, I I get some people call that, 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 that type the messages in over at uh, YouTube and they're like, you know, could, could you shorten your shows up? You know, you go on too much. I'm like, yeah, no, too bad. This is the way it is. So no, April Fools. It'll never happen that I have it. I can do I can do short shows when it's uh, some specific point I want to make, and I usually do those as videos, separate videos, not live shows. Uh, where I just want to focus in on one issue, then I can do 15, 20, 30 minutes. But these kind of shows, oh, no. <laughs> I got you, really? You're like, Pat Brown, 20 minutes for a show? Impossible. <laughs> got you, too. Yeah. Oh, by the way, Sky Ricky, just wanted to, you to know my daughter, my granddaughter, my son-in-law are in Toronto as we speak. They were on their way to... Um, Ireland last night and the connecting flight when they got there they got stuck on the tarmac and the connecting flight left for Ireland so not a good start to their vacation over there uh so anyway they got put up in a hotel they rented a car so they're running around Toronto now trying to make the best of things <laughs> so um, I'm hoping it didn't rain as much in Toronto as it did here today because man in Maryland we were soaked I mean it rained crazy oh and you can see and hear me. All right, things are good. What? Oh, this is funny, Scarlett. You say no intro, but actually when I see the shows, I do see the intro. So I'm not sure why some people are not seeing it during the live portion. But uh, there was once an issue with that and I and uh, StreamYard, which is my platform, fixed it. But recently, I've heard this a couple of times, but yet when I actually see the show, it is there. So I'm not sure if it's on your end this time. I'm going to blame your end. <laughs> By the way, if you'd like to be in the chat room um, with all these wonderful folks, it is a patron only chat room. I do not do live shows to the entire public because of the insanity that ensues. It gets you much more subscribers, but then you get crazy people. So I don't like crazy people. I like people who are interested in profiling and crime scene analysis. So if you'd like to be there, please click the link below, join Patreon, five bucks a month. You get at least eight live shows you can join in on and you support the channel. You don't have to do that. You can just, hey, please do subscribe, uh, click the like button, hit the bell so you get notifications. And um, if you want to support the channel in other ways, you can buy one of my books or click the dollar sign and you support an educational channel. All right, let's get to the show now. All right. Now, yes, these two. Okay, I got to get, I got to get cooler. Got to get ready. Yeah. Okay, well, I got to take my socks off too. Man, you know, if you have this problem that when you go to, I'm not in bed, but you know, you know, when you go to bed and your feet are cold and you put socks on and then you get in bed and then like five minutes later, your feet are too hot and you go crazy. So man, that's what I'm suffering from now. So, okay, I'm getting disrobed, <laughs> but, but not here. No, we don't have that kind of show and you don't want to see that. So anyway, all right. So anyway, um, let's get to this. Um, uh, Tiffany was 18 years old and Luis was 20 years old. So we're talking about very young people and um, seem like they're in the prime of their lives, have their whole lives ahead of them, you know, just seem like happy, happy people uh, with 
with friends. They seem like they have friends. Uh, they have things going for them. He's a college student. She was she was going to college. She was a volleyball star. She was like had a great opportunity uh, to play volleyball as, as a freshman in college, and it was amazing. And so everything looks good. It does. It looks good. Um, but then in 2000, I'm trying to figure who's who's who's, who's with which date was that on. Um, 2015 was what when things went bad for Tiffany. 2010 for Luis uh, and. I'm going to start showing you some of the interesting, weird similarities. All right. Hi. Welcome, Kathy from Florida. You're warmer than we are, but and we I wish I were there. <laughs> I always wish I was wherever there are palm trees. That's just me. So, all right. Now, Strega's here, too. Welcome, welcome. Strega says there was no... What the heck? That's so bizarre. I'm going to check after the show, but I... It usually is there during the actual show, and uh, that's good because I don't like to have to edit the show out and that messes things up. So anyway, I don't know. That's weird. I might have to check with StreamYard why people don't hear it during the show. Anyway, let's get to these cases. What is similar about these cases? All right. So you have two young people who appear to have much going for them. And before I start, I want to show you where I got my info from. Uh, uh, Unsolved Mysteries. Uh, the show about Tiffany is mystery at mile marker 45. And I will say this about unsolved mysteries. I'm not in love with them. Uh, uh, the reason being they're very dramatic. They definitely take the victim's family's point of view, regardless of what the, what the show is about. It's very, very touching. Okay. It's hard to watch and not feel for the people who, you know, they've lost their loved one. And that, that's definitely what they're aiming for. And it's not like it's wrong because, you know, if you lose a loved one, and I've talked to a lot of families of, <clears throat> sorry, of, <clears throat> wow, lost my voice. <clears throat> they've lost their loved ones. I've lost my voice. So theirs is worse. Um, they've lost their loved ones, and I've talked to them. And sometimes people, when they watch me on these shows, they're like, man, Pat, um, you're kind of cold-blooded, you know? You, you, you talk on the shows. You you can you can... You can talk about things that are horrifying and then you, then you tell a joke and you laugh and they're like, some people don't like my shows because of that. Um, but as a criminal profiler, I can tell you at a certain point, like a lot of homicide detectives, there's a lot of black humor that rolls in and um, you can sit there and you can look at pictures of dismembered people and eat pizza at the same time. It's not, it, it's, it's just a methodology. It's not like you're blocking out what you're looking at. It's not like, you have to compartmentalize, like a psychologist would like to, but you have to compartmentalize so that you don't get, you know, so you don't, your mind doesn't completely get destroyed. It's not quite like that. It's just a bit of, you've seen it a lot. And you can separate looking at crime scene evidence from what the family is going through. And so my hardest times have ever been is when I watch the families and what they say. So I can, you know, as, as hard hearted as I look, I can cry at a toilet paper commercial if they do it right. <laughs> when I feel somebody's what they're going through, I'm empathetic toward that. So I do watch these shows and I do feel things well up in me when I'm watching the show because I see the pain they're going through. And they are. Um, when I've talked to families in person, yes, I feel it. When I do things here, I can be very pretty much most of the time pretty straightforward and you know i'm doing my professional job in an analysis situation um a couple times on television on on, on, on live television on, i don't mean youtube but i you know i've done many many shows um national tv and the the one thing that'll do me in uh and it happened to me i think it was on the today show and i was talking about it, a girl that was killed and um her friend came on and her friend started choking up and I'm like starting to choke up with her. And then they come to me and go, so Pat Brown, what do you think? And I'm like, <laughs> and I, I was like, you know, because I feel their emotions. So, um, so Unsolved Mysteries does a great job of that. The problem I have with that is this, it's not a balanced show. It's almost always tries to make sure there's a mystery, even if there isn't one. And I'm not saying this case doesn't have it, but they do it constantly. And they, they, they leave out information they leave out evidence they sway things they manipulate because they're trying to 
put their show together. So I would not call it an unbiased show. It is entertainment for people, and sadly. And people like to get, they like to have their heartstrings pulled. They do. Um, it's, it's like, I don't know, it's like, I guess watching somebody else suffer essentially we we can we want to feel for them we want to also be thankful we're not them um and we want the drama part so that's that's why they do this because it works so grain of salt always with unsolved mysteries crime diaries night out uh, both of these are on netflix by the way um crime diaries night out is the uh the culminaris case um and it is a fictionalized version of it as a series um, the people look almost exactly like the people in real life. So it's pretty well done and it's extremely well acted. And, and it's interesting because I was getting into part of it. I'm like, where are they going with this? And where they were going was what actually happened historically. And it, it, it's a very strange case that took on a huge, uh, massive part of the politics of, of Colombia. And it, it, it showed how things got completely out of control and were quite insane. And so it's fascin It's a fascinating show, I have to say. It's a fascinating show. Um, so these are the two to watch if you want to go further than what I'm doing right here. Um, so now let's get to, to the things that I think are very similar in this show. So we, we go back to we have, we have these, um, these two lovely young people. And... You know, it's always sad to me because um, now these bo both of these cases were ruled. Her case was ruled a suicide. His case was ruled suicide slash accident. Um, and if this this is true, if it's true, one of the sad things is that they had their whole lives ahead of them, and for one foolish moment in time, lost everything, and their families did too. And so. If you're, a, if you're a young person out there ever watching the show, and I don't, I don't have a lot of young people watching my shows, that's my, my demographic here, but if you have grandchildren or children, anybody, try to get them to understand. I'm not saying I'm right now that these are not, um, they, that these could not be homicides, but I just want to point out so many times uh, a young person doesn't see the future and doesn't realize that a year from now everything could be different. And even older people, I have to say that too, even older people, you can have a year that just sucks eggs. You know, you're like, man, my, my life is going nowhere. Um, <laughs> I felt that way during COVID. I'm like, the COVID started. I'm like, man, this sucks. I hated every moment of it. But here I am today and things are better. So thank God, you know, I didn't off myself during, during a bad period of uh, time. So, you know, I always encourage everyone, hey, a year from now, you never know. You could be sitting someplace on a beach with a margarita going, ha. Last year, I thought my life was over. And this year, look at me now. So I always tell people, you know, life is always a roller coaster. Never let the dips, you know, keep you from thinking that that's it. Because it goes back up again, especially if you work hard to make sure it does. And that's my little, that's my little soapbox just for saving people's lives. Um, so anyway, we had these two. And the last time they were seen, so they were both, they were both having a kind of a, they were both at a party um, before their, demo, their, their demises. Um, a Tiffany actually was just across the street from her house. It was actually a family gathering. Now, this is this is some, you know, the, the car is down the road and people walking with balloons. That's just <laughs> that's just from uh, Unsolved Mysteries. I don't know that looked that way at all. Um, they're trying to ex kind of exaggerate how many people were there and how lit up it all was and all that part of their manipulation. But anyway, she was... Once over here, and she walked across the street, went to the party. Her parents were there. It wasn't it wasn't a teenage party. It was a relative party. So they, you know, they did have you know, cake, and they, uh, mom said they're making clam, clam bake, and all that stuff. New England, you know, well, they're in Mays Landing, New Jersey, but hey, New England style clam bake, having a good time. That was what she was doing prior to then what happened that later that night. Uh, say, uh, Luis. He was at a party. Uh, he went to, a, it was like a kind of a bar. It was Halloween night, um, 31st of October. He was dressed up. The girls were dressed up, you know, little devil things and all that crap. And he was partying with his friends. They were drinking. And this is, she was not drinking. Uh, I believe her alcohol level was zero. He was drinking. Um, and so they were both doing this. They were having a relatively good time. 
And then something happened. And this is very important because one of the most, when you look at anything, any whether it's a suicide, accident, homicide, what you look at is what happened right before it happened. You know, things don't happen usually out of the blue. There's something that precedes it. And um, in this case, these two people were at these two places and then something happened. And what was the important thing that happened? Okay. And this is where it gets tricky. In Tiffany's case, she had left the party and a friend called her mother to complain that Tiffany had st stolen her credit card and used it to buy $300 worth of stuff. And, um, and then her, and she was, uh, let me see, let me see if I can find this information on this um, as to when this happened. Um, the teen, so, so what happened is Tiffany's parents, they were over at the party, Stephen and Diane, they left the party to meet with the friend and her mom at the Valiante home. So in other words, they were here. Then the friend and the mom are all going to meet, come across the street, meet about this issue. Supposedly, Tiffany stole a friend's credit card. Um, Tiffany denied any wrongdoing on her part. And that there's a short conversation, like 10 minutes. However, after that, she walked away. And I'll get into that when I do the separate cases. She walked away and that was the last time she was seen. Over here, Luis, he was partying. He was with um, his then hopeful girlfriend, shall I call her a hopeful girlfriend, and his best friend and some other friends of his partying, having a good time drinking. They left. He left there. So he was seen there. Then he left and went to like a hamburger, a hot dog stand or something and with the two girls, his best friend and the girl he was hoping to have a girl as a girlfriend. Something happened at the stand. He got pissed off, threw his hot dog down and ran off. And that was the last. And then there's a little, little something that happened. But then then it was the last time he was seen. So we have in both cases, something happened to these two young people that was upsetting, upsetting to Tiffany, upsetting to Luis. Now, one can always say, is that enough that they should end up dead that night? I mean, really? So, so, so she did rip her friend off. <laughs> and so he had some issue. Apparently it was like, he felt like the girlfriend, I'll get into it, but the girlfriend was like not going to necessarily go forward as fast in the relationship as he wanted. Was that enough that these two people ended up dead? And, and what happened to them? Well, Tiffany ended up four miles away. She was hit by a train. Luis ended up fairly right, right near the hot dog stand, quite frankly, uh, running off and supposedly fell into this, what you would call, a, I don't know, a culvert uh, with rushing water um, and died in that culvert. That is, that is the claim anyway. So she was ruled a suicide. He was ruled suicide slash accidental death. Th that was where they went with it. So these two cases essentially ended up closed at that point. But both of these, both of these um, families had moms and dads. And interestingly enough, which is often what happens, the moms take a, a lead role uh, as like, you know, the mama bear type thing. And they fought that those, um, the determination that this was, these were not homicides. So uh, Tiffany's parents, especially mom came out blasting saying, there's no way my daughter was happy. She was off going off to college. There's no way she would have committed suicide. This isn't, this is nuts. This is not what happened. And Luis's mother, um, she's like, are you telling me that my son just ran off and fell into the this culvert and that was that? That was what happened that night. And and she had um, she had some visions. Uh, she she from uh, an indigenous kind of religious thing. Um, she had some visions that he came to her and said, "It's going to be in uh, mi cuerpo, uh, in my body." That you're going to find out what happened. So they did an exhumation of her son, and then the, then it went on from there. So. In this case, the suicide ruling has never been changed. They're still fighting to this day. So we're talking about, what did I just say, 2015. It's been eight years. They have lawyers. They have private investigators. They're still fighting like crazy to 
to say, hey, Tiffany did not commit suicide on the railroad track. And Luis's mother, um, she had a whole hell of a lot more success. It actually did go to the top courts in Colombia. Um, and I'll get into all of that, the whole big fight over that. Um, but she had more success, but in the long run, still not classified a homicide, but is one of the most discussed and questioned cases in Colombia history because of the drama. And, 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 and it's kind of, you know, in a way, it, it, you know, you understand how parents have to suffer because uh, Tiffany's mother so badly wanted to make this a bigger story. She did get some traction with, you know, Unsolved Mysteries, but not the traction that Luisa's mother got. But she was, um, they managed to hire people. I don't know if they paid the private investigators and lawyers. I don't know if they were just doing it for publicity. It's hard to say because, you know, in, in the U.S., sometimes they do get paid and the person goes broke paying them um, because they'll tell you whatever you want here. They'll keep, they'll keep investigating. They'll keep fighting as long as you pay them or they do it for publicity or they do it because they really believe it, but it's always a questionable thing. In this case, these parents actually have money. So they, they had something to work with. Uh, so did, so did the people they accused have something to work with too, but it so became a, um, a rich, rich family uh, dispute over the years in Colombia and just a massive drama. So they got a lot more play. Uh, than the, the Valiante family did. So that is the basics of this. So what I want to talk about is what happened, what happened just before these incidents? Did either one of these youngsters or both of them have emotional problems that the families refused to accept? Secondly, what set them off? If they did have emotional problems, what set them off in that moment? Three, even if you have emotional problems, it doesn't mean that you killed yourself or had an accident. Because you run off, you become um, much higher risk as a victim because you're out there in the dark um, and anything can happen. So you can become a victim just because you ran off. And so and sometimes it, it's just you made yourself available to some predator out there or some other situation. So it may not be that you intended it commit suicide or have an accident, but you just ended up alone, alone and at the, at the mercy of who, who, whoever, whomever, whomever, <laughs> I always forget the who, whomever, whoever you ran into. Anyway, that person. Um, and that's another issue. And then it's, once this occurs, is it, is it, does it become difficult when the family refuses to believe what the police say? Is it difficult for them to prove otherwise and then over time, is the proof believable? In other words, when you have time to conjure up a bunch of stuff, is it accurate? Or are you starting to get the experts coming in, you know, the, the paid experts to fight each other so that you always have the alternative and it makes your case more sympathetic? And also, do we, do we always believe the parents? And I know people want to believe the parents always, but sometimes parents don't tell the truth. Families don't tell the truth. They will downplay certain things that are going on. They will even lie about things that are going on. And sometimes they'll even plant evidence or create evidence or whatever in order to bolster the case. So that sometimes goes on as well. And we're going to see, did this, did any of these things have an, you know, an impact on these two cases? And I think many of those things did. And that's why I find these kind of really interesting cases. So I'm going to get started with the Tiffany case, but I'll check on your comments prior to that. Um, <laughs> um, <laughs> I definitely, I would leave a man before my hot dog. Well, it was a guy leaving her and tossing his hot dog down. But you know, people have them um, Emotions. You talk about young people too. They have they have a lot of emotions uh, that are not as controlled, and we have to understand that not as controlled as our people who are older, shall we say, um, that have been through a lot and know how to step back. You know, they're they're very vulnerable to instantaneous kind of decisions. But then again, a lot of times there's things that build up, and it's a straw that broke the camel's back. But the question is, do the parents want to recognize it? Well, let's go to Tiffany's case first. All right. So that was my 20 minutes. <laughs> and now you're going to get the other an hour and 40 minutes. All right. So let's go to, let's go to Tiffany. Now, Tiffany, um, 
she did appear to have a lot going for her. There's no question about that. Um, let me find some lovely pictures. I have some pictures of Tiffany here. There we go. Um, this is Tiffany. Uh, she, she, her family describes her as happy and go lucky and, and cheerful about all kinds of things. And, you know, she's a volleyball player and she's up for this, you know, great deal with the colleges, you know, everything's going, everything's smelling like roses. And then she goes to this party. Now, uh, for my background here, I hate to use the sun because I hate the sun with a passion, but they were the only ones that were concise. So I'm going to go with them as my, as my uh, outline here. The 18 year old's death was ruled a suicide when her body was found in 2015. However, the family believes Tiffany was murdered, insisting she was a happy young woman with ambitions. And there's no question she did have ambitions, but how happy she was, that's a question. And this, this is important in the, in the whole story. Um, the cold case was brought to light again with a uh, Netflix series, Unsolved Mysteries, in October. So they look into her death, uh, July 12th, 2015. The, that day, Tiffany and her parents went to a graduation par party in their town of Mays Landing, New Jersey, across the street. Things took a turn around 9 p.m. when Tiffany's friend called the late teen's parents to say that Tiffany was using their debit card. Uh, Tiffany's parents... Stephen and Diane then left the party to meet with a friend and her mom at the Valiante home. The late teen also showed up at the home to hash things out. Tiffany denied any wrongdoing on her part in the conversation. It said to last less than 10 minutes. All right. I, I can't remember whether Unsolved Mysteries went into this as much as they should have. And I think they left things out. So you say, okay, our friend accused her of this. Well, fact is the friend was not telling a lie the friend was telling the truth tiffany had taken her credit card without her knowledge according to the friend she had spent used the card for 300 dollars with purchases which were basically clothing um and some and some shoes and the uh and so while she denied this apparently her own parents, after the after after uh, Diane and her daughter, uh, after the, the other people left, Diane and her daughter went to Tiffany's car to look for the debit card after you know, after the friend left. This is when Tiffany's mom, Diane, saw her daughter slip the card into her back pocket. She had the card. <laughs> she lied, and also it had, it it came out that she had actually accessed her parents' bank account and and had stolen money from them as well. And the parents countered this by saying, oh, no, no, she had, we gave her a credit card. She had no reason to do this. If she had no reason, why was she doing it? So we have two instances of theft. And, and it wasn't that she came from a poor home, folks. You know, she came, she had parents, she was going to college, and she wasn't struggling. And the, what she spent her friend's card on included a pair of, like, slip-on shoes which, that were $80. Now, mom claims that they, and this is interesting, you have to pay attention to this. When you see these, these um, uh, shows or you even read something on the media, they'll say, oh, she found receipts that proved it was only $80 later. Well, who's saying that? Tiffany's mom, her lawyer, or is that actually from the credit card company? Because a friend said 300 and supposedly that was accurate. Um, $80 was for the pair of shoes. So maybe she did find the receipt for the pair of shoes, but that doesn't mean there was another stuff that was charged onto that card. And we don't, I don't know because that sort of was left out of anything I've read or on, on in, in the television show, the Netflix show. So, but we know something is true. Tiffany's a thief. Why? Why in God's earth would this woman be a thief? She's, Everything's going for her. She's happy. She's got friends. She's graduating. She's going to college. She's a volleyball star. Why would she steal any money from somebody? I don't know. But the family's not letting us know. And here's where we start looking at. The family is not telling us the truth about her psychological history. Because that's not normal. I'm sorry. There is no, I can't, I can't even imagine one of my children stealing their friend's credit card and using it at a store. Who does that? Somebody who is psychologically disturbed, that's who. And yet mom is saying, oh, Tiffany is perfectly fine. No, she's not. Now, there was a, 
other incidents that apparently in the past, uh, a teacher had found that Tiffany had an unusual bruise on her arm that was concerning. It didn't look like volleyball. And it turned out, uh, she reported it and turned out her mother said she had had an argument with Tiffany and punched her. And so they ended up going to therapy a few times and then everything was, so they made some progress and Tiffany supposedly wasn't suicidal or anything like that. Um, but obviously there were problems with mom. I mean, I don't know how many problems there were in the family. And this is what we don't know. And this is where you don't get this from these shows. If, if, if Tiffany and her mom are getting to the point where mom is punching her, and I'm not saying mom wasn't like so annoyed with her. She did punch her for a good reason and only on the arm. I'm not saying it's right, but I, I, I can get it. You know what I mean? It's like you're being such a stupid idiot. Boom. You know, but what's going on? Cause that's abnormal. Um, something's happening. And then her mother is trying to cover for her daughter for being a thief. So something's wrong there. And then it turns out there is more information coming out from her friends, which wasn't presented in the show that she had supposedly tried to cut, done some cutting of herself that she had recently come out as lesbian and she had had a girlfriend and the girlfriend and they broke up and supposedly according again to the family, we accepted her as being gay. That was not a problem. And her, the breakup with a girlfriend, not a big deal. Everything's not a big deal, but maybe it was a big deal. Maybe Tiffany was struggling. She was struggling. Um, so, and one other thing that, uh, the, that the uh, classmates said, um, one of her classmates said she had that uh, Tiffany had sent a, a friend a cryptic message on the night of her death that read, just answer yes or no, should I do it? Should I do what? And we know, well, we've never got an inf any information on what that even means. But a couple of Tiffany's friends also told detectives that the late teen harmed herself intentionally cutting her wrist and leg on two separate occasions. One friend claimed that Tiffany was depressed and suggested that untreated mental illness could have had something to do with her death. However, Tiffany's fa pa family, Tiffany's parents told the detectives they thought these claims were not true. But your daughter's a thief. And you have fights with your daughter that end up, <laughs> you're forced into, legally forced into having a therapy. Something is, something is not quite right. So I'm going to say Tiffany had issues. All right. And this is no matter what the family says, it's obvious. Tiffany had problems. So the fact that after we have a, the, the situation now where Tiffany is walked away. So, so oh no, let me get into what happened at that moment. OK, so Tiffany, they have this fight. And mom goes back in the house to talk to dad about the theft of the friend's credit card. This is after she sees Tiffany stuffing in her pocket. She goes into the house to tell daddy. And that's when Tiffany walks away. She walks down the driveway and there is, there is a, um, there is a photo, there is a photo of that. And this is what we see here on this one. And Tiffany, Tiffany's case, this is an actual video on a deer camera of her walking down the driveway toward the street and I guess it's a longish driveway. So she walks down the driveway, takes a turn, and is never seen again until she's found dead on the railroad tracks. Her phone is found at the end of the driveway. So now there's two stories that emerge here. One is that Tiffany walks away and in, in a, her parents are trying to find her. They're sending out, they're telling the friends she's run away. Well, they say that right away. She's run away. To me, that says they know something's, something's wrong. And they they're sending her messages to come home, come home. And they're not thinking, oh, she just went to a friend's house. Because clearly they think she's upset about something. So they must have some inkling something is more wrong than she's just going to go down the street to a friend and go hang out. Her phone is found at the end of the driveway. Like, And the, there's two options. One is she tossed the phone and said, screw you all and walked away without the phone so she wouldn't have to answer the phone. She wouldn't have to be, you know, GPS, whatever. She didn't want that phone anywhere near her. She wanted to walk away. That is what the police believe. The family says, oh, no, what we think is because she loved her phone so much, she would never, ever give it up, that at the end of the driveway, a car pulled up. And 
she saw somebody she knew. And so she got into the car. And as soon as she got into the car, that person took her phone away and chucked it out the window. So, so you would have to look, look at the timing on this. You'd have to believe that in those few seconds, Tiffany's so freaking unlucky that that few seconds she decides to walk to the end of her driveway, that evil killing killers come. She doesn't see them as evil killers, but she jumps in their car and the people she knows, which would be other students, then take her away and murder her and, and throw her body onto the train tracks. Okay, I'm finding that a little bit unlikely. I mean, you know, that isn't even probable. That's extremely improbable. The only other possibility is that she was kidnapped by a serial killer or a group of guys or somebody, for whatever reasons, she got into a car she did not know and there were bad people. That at least is a little more believable. But I do want to point something out here. She's a volleyball player, okay? Uh, she's a big girl, six foot two, I believe. Uh, I think that's what she was, six foot two. Six foot four. I think it's six foot two. But anyway, she's big. She's strong and she's big. And she's not the choice for serial killers or groups of guys. I mean, she's they go for little girls and she's a tough athlete. Could they could a group of people have abducted her in theory? But just at the moment, she hits the end of the driveway. Now, mind you, if she didn't know them, she's at the end of her driveway. She's in a neighborhood. There's a party going on across the street. Is she unable to run away, put up a fight, do anything? And she's a big girl. What are the chances that the serial killer group is just rolling through just at the moment she's at the end of the driveway? Now, the, the, the family will claim that she's uh, since she's walking down the street away from the house, and, uh, and as the show points out, they try to make it look very, very, um, very bright. And she's walking away. Somebody would have seen her. There's a party going on. Somebody would have seen her going further down the street. And then she has to get to the railroad tracks. So somebody would have seen her along the way um, to those railroad tracks because it's not there. wasn't There were, wouldn't be that many people out at that time of night. And she is a six foot two tall girl. She must have been seen somewhere if she were really walking along. That's why they say she must have been in a car and nobody saw her. But I have explained this before that, you know, if you're walking along a street and you don't want to be found, in other words, if she thinks her parents are out there looking for her and she doesn't want them to be found. She's like in a tizzy. She's like, I just want to walk away right now. I don't want to deal with anything. I don't want my dad to know. I don't want to talk to my dad. And you're just walking. Cause you know, people don't seem to think she would have walked very far. Why not? When you're pissed off, you walk a long way. <laughs> you can walk miles, you know, um, I think people don't remember when they're younger too. You can, you can, you can do some stupid stuff and walk a long way. So she's walking along and lights come. One of the, one of the detectives goes, Oh, you know, when she was coming out of the neighborhood, you could see lights in the bushes. Okay. You know what you do when you see lights, you step off the road and hunt, you just kind of hunker down in the bushes till the car passes. Then you go back out, you walk another or whatever. So you see enough more lights and then you just move into the woods, let them pass. And you keep walking. You get out of the way because you don't want your parents to find you. That's what you do. If there's if you think everybody's circling looking for you, you're going to hide. So I think that is not necessarily good information as to proof that she couldn't have walked away. So now we have the next issue is where did she end up? Well, she ended up four miles from her house. Let me show you a, a little picture of that. Um, where is it? Okay, let me find it. Um, I have a... Where'd my map go? Oh, here it is. Okay. So this is supposedly Tiffany Val Val Valiente's path. Um, now, the, the the attorney claims it's different than what the, what the police say. All right. Investigator. This is the investigator's belief. Uh, if you look down at the left corner, you see the Valiente home. And then you see that she would have taken a right and then she went along this other Wrangleboro Road up to a place, then down, down, down the railroad track, essentially, uh, that there was actually a railroad that went all the way through there. So she walked to the railroad track and got on the railroad track and then walked down the railroad track. Now, are there, are there other ways to get to the railroad track? Well, sure. 
You could take, instead of going around the Wrangleboro Road, you could turn left on Tilton Road. And this is going to play into this in a minute. You can take Tilton Road and go straight up there. But, you know, wherever you intersect with a railroad track, maybe where the train is coming, if that's what your intention is, is just to jump in front of a train, right? So uh, she may have thought, why walk all the way up Tilton Road to get to the railroad track when I can just go down that Genoa Avenue? And, and, and the train will get me there. But uh, the train wasn't there. So she starts walking along the railroad track, walking and walking because the, the train doesn't come that often. So it's a matter of time is when the train is going to show. So theoretically, she kept walking. Now you might ask, how did the police even think she walked the, that particular, uh, that's how she got there? Well, because they had dogs. They put the dogs on this and they asked not to know anything about anybody's thoughts about where she would have, how she would have gotten there if she did get there on her own. And this is the route the dogs took. The, the, the investigators did not know anything. They just let the dogs have at it. And that's where they ended up, near where she was struck by the train. Which is an interesting thing because the dogs are going along a route she might well have taken. And they did go to the near the location where she was struck. All right. Now, the parents say, well, it did rain after she was, you know, from the time she was struck to the time the dogs, it rained. So that's all meaningless. Well, usually what happens after rain is it's harder to determine than less hard to determine. So I'm not buying that one. So supposedly the, rain, the, the, the dogs put her at the track. All right. The next claim that is made by, by the team is that she was thrown, she was laid on the tracks. She was carried in a car to that location and there's a like there's an area behind there's kind of crappy little area where you could put a pull a car in and beat somebody to death or rape them and do whatever. Uh, supposedly uh, there was a an axe found near the track with some red on it, which probably was paint. But they're claiming that it, it got tossed because it, they said the police did a horrible job because it was the the train people that did the initial in, uh, investigation, calling it a suicide. And they're saying, well, that's because they sucked at what they did and they threw that axe away, and it could have been the axe that was that chopped her up. So they're kind of indicating that um, if you if they take a look at the the, the, the report here that that her arms had been kind of in other words off her body and so are her feet and they're saying that on there it says cut so therefore somebody chopped her arms and feet off before they put her in the track and then the train ran over her so it would cover up the murder and since they didn't her body was so messed up they never did uh, an, they didn't really do they did an autopsy but they didn't what was left of her, uh, but they didn't really do, um, didn't do a rape kit, which, you know, it's too bad. I think they should have, um, but there's reasons why I think they never did. Um, but then the claim is that, let me, let me find the, they claim that they're trying to see what they're trying to do is con con concoct a story, which they hope will be believable. Um, let me find the train. Okay, here we are. Uh, so they're essentially the train hits her they're claiming that she's lying on the tracks and all that blood there is not from being hit by the train, but that when they chopped her up and put her body there, then she bled out there. Okay, none of this really works <laughs> terribly well. First of all, we don't even know this, this is blood. Could be something else there, um, but they're claiming it is. All right. So somehow they're saying they laid her body in the tracks with missing hands and uh, arm, hands and feet, and the train then hit her dragged her for a quarter of a mile to mess up the, the murder scene so nobody would be suspected. Well, it's pretty weird. I mean, generally speaking, it's I can say it's extremely rare that anybody puts a body on the track to cover up a crime like this. It's just, it's extremely strange. And all this would have happened. Somebody would have had to pick her up from that exact moment, take her off to this, this lot near the train, do something to her, hack her up with an ax, and then chuck her in the train tracks. It's a lot of work. Why don't you just hit her over the head and check her on the train tracks? But anyway, she's supposedly lying in the train tracks when the train runs over her because she's dead. Okay. Here's the big problem and why it was listed as a, as a suicide. The people on the train, one of the fellows on the train said he saw her step into the tracks. And then he tried, he put, play, they hit the brakes, they play, did the horn and they hit her. But, you know, um, 
what they've tried to say since then is they, they interviewed him a bunch of times and, and his story changed a bu bunch, a, a wee bit. Um, you know, if you have to think about this, if you're a young man and, and you see this, this all of a sudden it's, it's no, this all happens like this. It's, it's not something you get a chance to go. I think I see a lady in the tracks. Let me think about this. Oh, now we're closing in on her. Let me think about this. Oh, I see we've hit her. Now let me think about this. This is not how it works. It's like, Holy crap. And you're hitting horns and you're putting on brakes and then boom, it's, it's a horrifying incident. Probably that poor young man who saw this is devastated has never gotten it out of his head. But what they're trying to claim, because his story did change when they went back and they, he tried to re-explain when he saw her, how he saw her, it did change. But here's where I don't think it makes any sense where they're claiming it changed. They're saying that her, she was laid down on the tracks. And I'm going to say this. There's a huge difference between seeing a body laying in the tracks and a person standing up and jumping in front of the train or falling in front of the train. That is completely different. I, I cannot see where this young man wouldn't have, having seen her laying on the tracks, wouldn't have gone, oh my God, there's a body in the tracks. <laughs> he saw somebody coming into the tracks. I think that emblazoned in his mind. I can't believe he made that up. There's no reason for him to lie. Not one shred. So when right after she was hit by the train, they essentially said it was a suicide because it looked like she was alive, stepped into the tracks and got hit, according to the witness. Witnesses aren't always correct, but I cannot see that. I, there's a huge difference between this and this. Sorry. And he's got absolutely zero reason to lie. So they labeled it a suicide. And because they labeled it a suicide, I will agree that they probably did not do the best job after the fact. Um, it was obvious to them. And sometimes what the problem with obvious is it may actually be exactly what it is, but because you don't do the procedures afterwards that may take away the questions later, the questions will always be there. So essentially she was dragged for some quarter of a mile and you're talking, <laughs> this is what people don't get. They're like, you know, she, she ended up with, I think her underwear um, and her, her shirt wasn't on her body. Underwear was on her body. She was missing her shoes missing her headband that you see. Um, let me see where, where to go. Where to go. Um, you will see in her, uh, the last video of her going along, she has shoes on her. I can't actually see it here. She has, you can just see a little line, but she's got shoes on her feet and she's wearing a pair of, uh, it's actually blue jean shorts and, and a shirt and the shorts are missing. And shoes are missing. And this leads the family to believe that she was taken someplace those, those jeans were removed from her body in a rape or something like that. And I'll get to the shoes in a minute because this is a really interesting part of the story. And that, therefore, when they put her body in the track, she didn't have her shoes on, her headband was not on, and they don't explain what happened. Oh, and the, the reason the shorts aren't there is because they're in somebody's vehicle. So then she's run over by the train, and that's that. However, a quarter of a mile. Now, we're, you know, when you're talking about a car, a car has four wheels. The car goes thump, thump, and doesn't use, sometimes it'll drag you, but a lot of times it just goes over you. If it drags you, just there's still only four wheels. A train has many, 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 many very heavy, very, uh, we, you know, metal wheels that if you're on that track and you get sucked under that train with the speed of the train and the movement, of all those wheels and all the, I mean, I'm not a train expert. Some, some guy who goes to train museums could, tear me apart, but you get things going on, you know, parts of the trains moving. I don't know what happens underneath those carriages, but if your body is sucked under there, the amount of, the amount of trauma your body sees, how many cuts to your body and cuts is okay. Cause their the family's claiming cut is, Oh, it was like, had to be sharp. It wasn't like ripped from her body, but you have sharp, you have a lot of sharp things turning that cut. So that's a perfectly good reason why they'd say cut and mangled and everything else. She was in pieces lots of pieces. And what they do after that fact is once they, they try to clean up the track, they have to get the part, body parts off the track. Did they do a good job? I'm not saying they did. I don't know where some of these items could have gone to, but they could have gone up inside the train. They could have, they could have been 
shredded into such small pieces nobody even saw them. They could have flown away. Who the hell knows? I don't know. But she, her family later on went back to the tracks and started finding pieces of her. It was horrifying um, on the tracks, but little, you know, little pieces and little parts of things because that's how much of her was everywhere. So no, they didn't do a particularly good job as far as protecting evidence in that situation. But I think they, they, they according to them, she stepped into the tracks, she was hit, it was suicide. They were, they were just cleaning up the scene. Now, so the parents came up with some other interesting thing, which is where I think so many people believe this had to be a homicide. Her shoes were not found and her headband wasn't found. But a day or so later, her, her family was combing the whole area, theoretically combing the whole area. And if we go uh, and supposedly they came upon the shoes and the headband. Uh, let me find a picture of that. Um, hold on a second. Is this it? No, that's the train. Here we go. All right. If we remember the path she took, this is the house. And she supposedly went down here and then walked down the tracks. Now, since she didn't have her shoes on her feet, um, they show a picture of her foot, which I'm sure wasn't on her body. But they show a picture. I'm not going to show it here. And say, look, her, her foot doesn't have any scratches or any this and that. If she walked on gravel or on the train tracks or that distance, she'd have all this damage to her feet. I'm sorry. I don't know how true that is. I mean, I've walked in bare feet a lot of my life. You get tough feet. Your feet aren't that messed up because you walked on some gravel or some on, on, on a train track. I don't know. I think that's exaggerated because I didn't come home with messed up feet when I did it. So, um, but they claim that's, you know, if, if she lost her shoes, her shoes weren't here at the, at the site that if she took them off somewhere along the way, then she couldn't have possibly walked barefoot. Well, first of all, they were brand new shoes. These are the $80 shoes she had purchased. Um, with the, with the credit card. They were brand new. Um, and I don't know whether she wore socks. This is something nobody ever discussed. Did you know the small socks that don't come above your ankles, the ankle socks, and you can't really see them. So in the, in the photo uh, of her from the deer camera, you don't, if you look back at that, that photo, um, and I had to cut her feet off, so that doesn't help you any, but anyway, you can't see, you just see a line. So, you know, the shoes there, but you can't see any more than that. So, she could have had little anklets on. And, you know, sometimes if you got brand new shoes and they start hurting your feet, you could take the shoes off and walk in your socks. So it's possible she used the socks all the way there and they, they disappeared in the train and got all ripped up in little shreds. And that was that. That's possible. Um, also, it's possible that she wasn't wearing socks and the, tra the, the new shoes started giving her a blister and she just took them off and said the hell with it. I don't know if that's true. So the parents doing this little, the looking around and in, instead of her, you know, she went supposedly this way, they found her shoes over here, which would be the other way to the train tracks. If you were going that way. So what their claim is, is she was grabbed in a car. She was in a car. Then she was abducted here that the car went here and then the car must've gone up here and somehow she escaped the car. And then the mom is basically saying that, um, where I have the picture of the shoes. Where's my shoe picture? Um, uh, where's my shoe picture? Yeah. Hello, shoe picture. Hold on a second. Lost my shoe picture. Where are my shoe picture going? Now that's that's a better picture of where the shoes are at. But where's my shoe picture? Hold on a second. Ah, uh, technical issues. Technical issues. Where's my shoe picture? Hold on, it's here somewhere. I swear to God, I put the shoe picture. Where my shoe picture go? This is really annoying. Okay, I got that one. I got that one. Oh, I got a, I, Well, my shoe picture vanished. Oh, good Lord. Okay, hold on a second, folks. I'm going to go search for my shoe picture because it, it's, a worth, it's worth seeing, and I somehow blew it getting it over here. So let me find it. Oh, shoe picture. Uh, where is it? Um, what is the weirdest thing ever? My shoe picture vanished completely. Hold on. Hold on. Shoe picture. Huh. Well then. Interest. Hold on. Just one more second. You know how I know this happens once every show. Something goes wrong and my pictures vanish. Ah. Okay, hold on one sec. I gotta find my shoe picture because this was such an important picture. I can't believe it's not there. I don't know where it went to. Okay, hold on a second. 
It's supposed to be that picture. Yeah, that picture. Where? How can this not be here? Hold on a second. Let me go back and see if I just just, just didn't see it. The, the pictures are really tiny. That's what I keep telling you guys. You don't know how small these pictures are so that it's really hard to see sometimes what you've got up here. So I think it, I think it went missing on me. So I'm going to send it over. I'm going to send it over because I really want you to see this picture. It's really important. Um, one more sec. One more sec. It's coming. It's coming. Okay. Takes like 10 steps to make it come over. <laughs> yeah, it's not so easy. It really isn't. Okay, here we go. Theoretically, it's going to show up just about now. I'm going to check a QR picture. No, that's the train thing. What the heck? No, it just went missing on me. I want you to see a close up of that picture up here, the shoes, because just because uh, this is so important to the family, and, and I want to discuss it for that reason. All right, let me find the. Is it going to come over? Hold on a second. Where is it? Where is it? Okay. This is where you, this is where you go get a drink and come back. Huh? <laughs> okay. It is now supposedly coming over to this one, but mm, come on. Let's not be slow here. Let's not be slow. It's going to be slow. Crap. All right. This is not going to, no, no. It's going to cooperate with me. Okay. So look at the darn shoes. <laughs> I'm going to try in a minute. The shoes were under a tree. Uh, so if, if right about here, which is not where the dogs went, which is my point. The dogs did not go here. Mom finds the shoes that look like this under a tree. And also her headband is there. And she claims that she thinks that, that like Tiffany jumped out of the car and then they grabbed her and pulled her out of her shoes. And Tiffany's hanging onto a little tree for dear life. And, and her headband goes off and the shoes, she, she gets pulled out of her shoes and dragged back into the car. That's one of the theories. Of course, the dogs never went this way. Of course, if they, when she was in a car, they would never have gone that way, but they did go all the way around here. So unless the dogs are completely wrong, we don't know why she would be here. Now, the, the second theory the family has is that they took her someplace and after they killed her, the shoes, her shoes, were in the car with a headband and they took them and planted them underneath the tree. Okay. Why they would do this is questionable. I mean, if, you know, usually if you have evidence left over, you're not planting it someplace. You're going to make sure you destroy it. You just take it, you take it someplace nobody's ever going to see, throw it in a dumpster, yeah, throw it in a fireplace. You don't need to leave it over here as if you're doing some clever thing to confuse people. You know, you made it look like she killed herself here, but you're going to leave the shoes down here. Why would you do that? So you would, you might as well just throw the shoes on the damn train track. So that, that makes no sense. So if they killed her here, her shoes would be here too. Unless this story about her possibly jumping out of the vehicle and being pulled back in and her shoes coming off, hanging onto trees is true. Now, there's possible other possibilities. One is those aren't th that we're what we see in the in the video is some so she has some some small shoes on. We don't actually know what those shoes were. So we have to go back and look at the video. Just because the parents say those are the shoes, these are the shoes that we see that we see on her feet, which I can't, which you can't see here, but it's a little white strip. That's the same shoes. Okay. Well, I don't know. Are they, or are they not? Do we actually know what she was wearing on her feet? Her, I don't know. Did her mother really notice the shoes? Did, did the friend say, she, did anybody see the shoes at the party and say, those are the same shoes as the shoes that were found in that on, on the side of the road? Is there, is there any proof of that going on? Or is this just guesswork? You know, so this is this is the problem that we don't even know what she's wearing on her feet. But let's say those were the actual $80 shoes she stole, she bought with a friend's credit card. And those shoes that were found under that tree, which I keep trying to pull up that stupid picture. Let's see if it showed up yet. Um, let's see if it came, came about yet. Um, mm -hmm. It really doesn't want to come over. That's so sad. Huh. It's just, it just, it's just, 
just uh, not functioning. Well, let's go back to the, the picture of the shoes anyway. Those are supposed to be the shoes uh, that you see. Now, were those the shoes on her feet? If they were, why are they where the family found them, which is on which is on the route that she was not on, according to the dogs. So did she get kidnapped there or were the shoes planted there? So if you know what the shoes are, if you're at home and you, I'm not saying mom did this, but if you're at home and you see what shoes they were, you can buy some more shoes that just like that and you can put them there. That and a white headband. Now, was there DNA of Tiffany there that gets real questionable? Does she have more than one pair of shoes that are similar? And she just used one of the pair of shoes. Did these shoes have damage to them from walking? You know, they're supposed to be new shoes, but they'd be scuffed up a little bit. Were they scuffed up or were they new? So this is all the stuff we don't know. Uh, but there's no real good reason why those should be there. But I, not saying mom did this, but when you want somebody to say, when you're trying to prove things, it's not, it's not been beyond parents to take away evidence or to add evidence in order to make it look like something happened so you can get the attention of the police because that's what you want. Um, so I don't know. Um, the other possibility is for whatever reason, Tiffany started to go this way, sat down on the ground, took a pee or whatever, took the shoes off. She was sweating. She took the headband off. Who knows? And then decided she's going to walk on. And she said, no, I'm not going to go this way. I'm going to go back this way. Why the dogs wouldn't go there, I don't know. So there's a whole question about the shoes. And that's what that's the thing that this case hinges on, is the shoes being in a place they theoretically shouldn't be. Um, so she either had the shoes on when she got hit by the train and the shoes just got demolished. Or another possibility is, and there's another possibility, Somebody found the shoes when the family was going up and down and th the train tracks and found the shoes. Is it possible that they moved the shoes to another location to make it look like she was kidnapped? I don't know. And we'll never know unless people are put under polygraphs. We, 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 we won't know who's telling the truth, but I will say this whole case hinges on two things. One that she left the house under duress, having been found out, that had an argument. She was, I, I believe, emotionally unstable. She was just found out to be stealing. I don't know if that would affect it, if her, if her friend reported that to the police, whether that would affect her, her getting a scholarship, whether she just didn't want dad to find out, whether she was broken up about the girlfriend who dumped her, whether she had many more issues than we know, that she was unhappy and cutting herself, and this was the straw. She walked away and stepped in front of the train, which is what the man on the train said happened. Then he saw her step in front of the train. So I find absolutely nothing that makes any sense that she got miraculously kidnapped right there at the end of the driveway and that somebody decided to hurt her and then lay her in the train tracks. But the guy saw her step into the train tracks. None of that works for me. Um, so I'm going to say I think this is still exactly what the police said it was, a suicide. Um, no evidence to point elsewhere. The, the shoe thing is weird. Uh, but I don't know whether whether the shoes were planted, moved, whatever. I haven't having a clue. Um, but it doesn't make any sense to me. I, I can't I can't see. I said first of all, she's six foot two, so that she would got kidnapped right at the end of her driveway, and then these guys would get turn that turn on that road, and she would jump out, and they pull her out of her shoes, and her headband would fall. But everything set there kind of nicely for everybody to find, and then they take her down to the tracks and, and, and beat her up and chop her up and then put her on the tracks. But lo and behold, she's seen stepping into the tracks. I mean, you know, it's just, it's, 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 it's a concocted story and somebody is concocting between the fam the, the parents and the, and the, the private investigator who, and then the, the, um, uh, the lawyer trying to concoct a story to make it fit anything they can make it fit the alternative theory. And I just, I, I don't find there's any validity in it. So that's my take on this one. Before I go on to Luis and his situation, I'm going to check on your comments. So, uh, cause I know it's, it's a very emotional one. If you watch the, uh, yeah, this is, this is true, Scarlett. Uh, yes. Um, some people are not young. People are naive. They don't have life experience and they don't have, you know, if you haven't had that many ups and downs, you think this is it. I mean, I do remember being a teen and I wasn't a happy one. 
mind you. So I wasn't a drug user. I wasn't a cutter. I wasn't suicidal, but I wasn't happy either. Um, I was frustrated and I could not see what I could do really with life. Then over time, as life went on, I did have ups and downs. But because I'd had experience that once I'd been down, I came back up. And once I got down again, I came back up. To this day, I always say to myself, you know, <laughs> hang in, hang in, because you can something good will happen or you can make something happen. May not be what you expect. It may be a different uh, type of life, but something will come out of it. Don't give up. Don't give up. But that was from experience. But when I was a teenager, luckily I wasn't suicidal. Um, I, 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 I didn't have the experience to believe I could crawl out of it or the, the, the roller coaster would go back up a hill and all things would be fantastic again. I didn't have the experience. So I think that's a, that's a big thing. Uh, more Murray vibes. Yeah. More Murray was a mess. Um, she drove off again. Like you said, this is, this, this is one of the things of the more Murray case, more Murray people. Oh, I don't know. Something must have, you know, she, um, she's going hiding in Canada and all kinds of other stuff, but she actually was a mess when she left and she left because there was a lot of things that were catching up to her that were making her life difficult. And instead of saying, you know, I've screwed up really bad. I'm going to have to pay the penalty. But even so, people can recover from bad decisions. Apparently, she did not think that way. Um, kleptomaniac. Well, she was stealing. She was stealing money in order to buy stuff. Um, and I don't know. That's a, it's really weird because it's like kleptomania in the sense that you're pointing out that. People who steal stuff, a lot of times kleptomaniacs don't need the crap they steal. It's not like they're stealing food for their children. They're stealing stuff that's dumb, you know, things that they don't need. Even rich people who are big kleptomaniacs, some stars I won't mention the name of, movie stars, um, steal just for the thrill of it. And that's the problem. If you steal for the thrill of it, and kleptomania, first of all, I think is a garbage term. Um, it's it, it, That was one of the psychological terms that I've always objected to, where it's this concept that the person can't help themselves. They have to steal. They, they have to do it. No, they don't. They're, they got, they, the problem is they have no respect for other people. They have no respect for that line. They get thrills out of doing bad things, getting away with stuff. That's called psychopathy. <laughs> That's not called, I couldn't help myself. It's psychopathy when you do things like that. So stealing your friend's credit card and using it to buy junk, just to, some item, when you have a great life ahead of you, why are you doing that? Is it because you want to get caught? Because you're just angry at the world and you think if you do this, everybody will pay attention to you? Or do you are you suffering some kind of narcissism, some kind of personality disorder where you want to get over on people where you like to maybe maybe you have vengeance issues. Maybe you like to like think it's funny that you can buy something with somebody's card and then go to go to where she's actually at with the new stuff you just put on your feet. And, and she's like, oh, nice shoes. And you're like <laughs> with your card. Is it that's kind of that's kind of um, that's kind of a personality disorder. That's what I'm going to say. So there's some issues there that are uh, severe. Um, uh, as far as, uh, yeah, this is, you know, Grandma uh, Tats, Tats talking about when you have a, 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 a child who's diagnosed with certain uh, mental, mental uh, conditions, sometimes you do think it's your fault. And it's, it's a weird combo of, you know, sometimes life isn't as good as we could have made it for our children, which is why they do end up with issues. On the other hand, sometimes life just happens. And on the other hand, sometimes that kid is just that kid and you can never figure out what the hell the problem is. The other kids are fine. And this kid is the one that's driving you insane. Um, and sometimes that's why parents do try to figure out if they've contributed or haven't contributed. It's, it's, it's tough. It is very, very tough. It really is. Um, oh, yeah. Uh, this is probably true. Tiffany needed help before that night. I would guess that is true. And she did go to get therapy before, but this is another thing. Just because you've been to therapy and, and the therapist says, oh, she's not, she's not suicidal and she's not depressed. Where did she get that from in three sessions? I'm going to say the girl lied. <laughs> you know, I'm not suicidal. I'm not depressed. Come on now. I mean, if you think you can get that out, just because somebody tells you that is not make it true. So I'm questioning that therapist. Oh, Lord Almighty. Um, 
Um, Grandma Tass says, I think the murder story is fantastical. She seems very troubled. I think so too. I mean, the thing is you can, when, when people present these kind of stories, they come up with things and you're like, well, you know, it could have happened. Okay. It could have happened. What are the chances that actually did happen? And, and happened in a sequence where everything works out the way it does. That's when things get pretty much improbable. Uh, and of course, everybody points out improbable is not absolutely impossible. And this is where the court goes wrong too, where the, the instead of being um, reasonable doubt, it turns into, do you have a shadow of a doubt? Well, everybody always has a shadow of a doubt because my God, it could be that one time in a million that something freaky, so freaky happened. But there's no evidence and to point to that being anything rational. Um, well, a reason to get help for your child if they show signs of stress, stealing, cutting, and lies. Yeah. Now, the mom says that that's just not true. Her friends are lying. Now, why would her friends lie? I mean, what? Why? I, you know, that's it. for a friend to even say that. I mean, I'm going to say they knew something. And then she's like, should I do this right before she went? Should I do what? And they never was explained. Um, so that that's weird, too. Um, yeah. So, the, you know, that's definitely... Um, uh, VLW says, aren't shoes typically parted from a body when someone is hit by a vehicle, just the force of hurling them off? One would think. And we're not just talking about one hit. <laughs> this is why I point out about the train wheels. They go fast. She's thrown up underneath the train. Shoes in pieces. I mean, we're not talking about, you know, she was just hit and laying there and, you know, in, on, on, on a poor condition. We're talking about pieces. So yes. And so when a piece gets caught too, it doesn't mean that let's say, let's say that something gets hit and it's thrown into the air. It doesn't mean it just nicely jumps to the side of the train and lays there. It may hit the train many times. And so yeah, the shoe, God knows where they could be. Or if the shoes are completely disintegrated by the train or some of the, or they were someplace out and the family found a couple of them and decided instead of saying they were by the train tracks, which would make it look like she got hit and the shoes were there. They put the shoes someplace else and said, see, she got kidnapped. I'm not saying the family did this, but I'm just saying if I were the police, this, I would be looking into that because the shoes ending up there is a bit of an oddity. And I don't know that a, there, there were shoes she was wearing and B, I don't know that she herself took them off or that somebody pulled her out of them. Those three things I would have to work on to see if there's anything legitimate that the shoes got there somehow and weren't put there somehow. So, um, and this, this is often true. The parents are going to grasp at anything that fits their narrative. When you can't accept, yes, yeah, you will do that. And the sad thing is here is, you know, when you have, they brought on uh, unsolved mysteries, they brought on the, you know, the, the lawyer. I've seen the lawyer stuff and it, it was not impressive. Um, and then the, the private detective, and if he's charging hundred bucks an hour, he can find a lot of things to investigate. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. And, and, and it, it bothers me because uh, a lot of people will do things to support a, a victim's family in whatever belief they have. Uh, maybe they truly believe it. Maybe the, maybe the lawyer really believes she was murdered. Maybe the private investigator really believes she was murdered. I don't know. But if they came to me first, I would have told them within amount of hours I just spent on this, that the likelihood of her being murdered was like that, this, and you know, what probably would have happened. They would have then sought out somebody else because they wouldn't agree with me. And they, they would say, Oh, she doesn't know what she's talking about. And they'd move on. So a lot of times what I find happens with families is they will come. I've had families come to me and then they come, they've already been to five other people maybe, and they're going to go on to five other people till they find the one that will support them. And then they'll stick with them. So that's, that's kind of the way it works. Um, that's, hey, Stephanie, thank you. I'm barefoot 90% of the time inside and out. Only time I've ever had anything hurt my foot is I stepped on a bee. Yeah, if you if you never wear shoes a lot, you know, you've got pretty tough feet. You know, it really does. Um, uh, uh, I read that the train driver said she appeared to wave at him and then stepped into the tracks. Well, at that, it, it, there were three different stories he told. And, and the, the, the main guy apparently had his back turned, and this was like a student guy. Um, again, guys have no reason to lie. And I, 
they, the, the lawyer, this is what the lawyer's story is, that she was lying in the tracks. And when the train hit her, the pieces flew up. And that's what he mistook for a person stepping into the tracks. <laughs> no, he saw her from a distance. She wasn't laying down. It wasn't like he suddenly hit something and then these pieces came flying up and he went, oh, that must have been somebody stepping into the tracks. It, it, the story's ridiculous. Um, I don't know. He, she jumped in and went like this or some, she fell in. You know, who knows? He saw it in such a flash. And of course, you're not paying attention to exactly what the person is doing. You just know the person is entering the tracks and they're going to die if you can't stop the train, which usually you can't. So it's horrifying and traumatic for him. Um, no, no, I wanted the bigger shoe picture of BLW. No, the shoe was there, but there was a, I had a better, a better close up of the pick, the, the whole thing. So, no, that one disappeared. I have sound problems now. What? Oh, I hope not. God. Um, uh, Kate Klein says, I uh, think she definitely committed suicide, may have thought she would be arrested. Her scholarship would be taken away in public humiliation. Possibly. That could have just sent her right over the edge. Um, See what else you have to say before I go on to the other side. Um, a VLW says, my grandfather was killed in a vehicle train collision. Even though he's inside the car, the body was more or less torn to bits. Tiffany being unprotected by a steel car would be a mess. Absolutely. Hands down on that. Oh. So can everybody hear me clearly now since I'm being told that there was an issue? So, <laughs> um, Fairy Princess says, I came in late, <laughs> but the train guy would be the one who had the best eye. Uh, you know, there's no reason for him to lie. And this is going to also impact the next case as well. Can I, let me just be sure you can all hear me. Somebody said there was an issue. So I haven't seen any problems um, so far. Usually if I have a, a sound problem, I usually see something wrong with my face, like I'm freezing or something. All good. Okay. All right. The sound issue was way off for just a second. Okay, for a few seconds, we can live with it. It's a live show. All right. Clear now. Mm. So annoying. Weird. I don't know. No clue why. But anyway, let's go on to the other guy. This is Luis. This is uh, 2010 in Colombia. Um, and again, family says happy, happy guy. Nothing's wrong. Everything's good. You know, so... Uh, there can't be any issue of him doing anything to himself. So here we are in Colum Colombia. This is Bogota, Colombia. And so he goes, so essentially what happens is he goes out for the night on the town. It's, ha it's, ha it's Halloween. It's Halloween. Um, he, he's um, you know, dressing up, you know, going to the club. Here he is. Here he is with a girlfriend that he's at the club with. This is the girl he's trying to date, by the way, trying to date. And I say that by they were dating, but she was she had broken up with another guy. So, you know, he was trying to move in and she was pretty hot. And uh, so <laughs> there was a good reason why he him. So now in the night, all right, we have three people involved here. All right. This is Luis. And this is, oh, no, I forgot her name. So let me, let me pull this stuff up. Uh... Hold on one second. I just want to pull up the, the information on the case. So I don't get all their names wrong. Um, um, somebody just, what the heck is that? <laughs> who, who just did that to me? <laughs> somebody just, somebody just uh, uh, texted me. Did you mean to post nudes on your story? And I'm like, what? And then just kidding, in case your heart dropped, April Fools. That was a good one. That one actually did get me in the middle of a show. That was, that was really good. <laughs> I approve of that entirely. <laughs> that was that was fantastic. Oh my gosh. All right. So let me go to Coleman Nauris and just give you the, the basics on Coleman Nauris. All right. So because I gotta get the name straight on these on these people. So uh, his name is Luis Andres Col 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 Colmenares, 20-year-old student at the University de los Andes. Uh, he died after falling into a flooded culvert in Bogota's uh, Parque Vire after a Halloween party in 2010. All right, now, so he goes to the party. All right, now, who was he with? This is Laura Moreno. This is the girl he had the hots for. And this is um, his best friend. Her name was, 
Okay, hold on a second. What's her name? Um, okay, let me find her name. Come on, where's her name? For God's sakes. Really? Where did her name go? I'm going to have to go to the other, I have to go to the other one now. Um, I have to go to the more longer one so I can get her name because I bugs me not to know that. Okay, went to Bogota's hottest party on that night. But they they have they had money, you know, um, in the zona Luis Andres. Oh, so in the hot party district, the zona. Um, so he goes, uh, and Laura Moreno is the girl he's into. Okay, hold on a second. Let me see who else he's with. He's also with, oh, okay. Her name is Jenny Quintero. That's his good friend. She's been a good friend of his a long time. They don't have a romantic relationship, but they're just very close. So he's with the two girls and a, and a few other guys. Okay, so they're all they're partying hardy. They're having a good time. Actually, this is a picture of them at the party, having a great time. Just they're drinking. Was he drunk? Certainly close to it, if not over. But you know, drinking, having fun, all's good. All right, but then things go badly. Supposedly somewhere at this party, at least in the show, he's like trying to make time with her and she's like pulling away and he gets kind of pissed off. All right. And he thinks that maybe she's just been, you know, stringing him along, maybe to make her ex-boyfriend jealous or maybe she's just not into him. And he says this basically, um, let me find it. The thing is, I'll always be just El Negro to you. Now, let me explain what El Negro is because there's a little confusion on that. Um, El Negro means the black, and he is partially indigenous. His mom is from an indigenous group, so he is darker skinned than some other Colombians. But there's a lot of mix in Colombia. So generally speaking, it's not done as a slur. It's done as an effect, an affection. It's 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 like a um um it's a it's a it's a name, you know, like like honey or sweetie. El Negro is like, oh, you know, you're El Negro. You might be blondie or la, uh, flaca, which means skinny girl, skinny, flaca. Hey, flaca. Hey, blondie. Hey, El Negro. You know, so it's more like that. However, in the show, they do kind of push this when it gets down to the court level that they're saying maybe there's some racism going on here, that she was with him, but she really wasn't, you know, going to stay with him because he was slightly darker skinned. And that may just be blown up, but... They, you know, so supposedly he got pissed at her because like, hey, you know, you just been, you're not really with me, right? You've just been playing with me. So he's upset. So he and the two girls leave the place. Suppose he's in a bad mood, but he's hungry. You know, <laughs> I always eat when I'm in a bad mood. So, okay. So they go to the hot dog stand and they're eating the hot dogs and he gets pissed at the hot dog stand. So he tosses the hot dog down and runs away, like runs away into the night. Now, this is what the girlfriend says or the almost girlfriend says, she says, I ran after him and he let go of me. Supposedly, um, supposedly she like grabbed onto him, trying to talk to him. He ran away. She grabbed onto him again and he ran away. She had high heel shoes, but she still went after him. Supposedly his good friend didn't go after him. And that was a contention. You know, it's like, oh, why didn't you chase after your friend? Um, and then she said, he then ran away from me and he fell in the canal. She claimed she saw him run and then like disappear in like the canal area and then she's called every she's calling and they're then they're, then she's back with her and they're trying to figure out where he is and they're looking for him and she kind of claims that she went down to the canal but nobody really believed her because her shoes were dry and maybe really it's kind of a steep canal so i'm not i'm not sure i believe that one either but maybe she didn't want to look bad like you know i wouldn't do it um she could have taken the shoes off you know but anyway um that she would actually go down there i kind of doubt that but um so anyway, these two are together and they're calling people and they're searching for him and they can't find him. OK, so it says here, let me read you the, the proper one. Uh, so after she ran after him and he, she thought he fell into one of the canals, it took two hours for the authorities to be notified and 12 hours to find the body. Now, so they went to search for it a couple times. All right. So that this becomes one of the issues in the case. So they searched the first time. Um, so it essentially looks like, see how it's, it's very steep. And, and here's a picture of it, you know, and it, it's, it's something to fall into. Now they're down there trying to find his body. They go into this tunnel and they don't see him in there, supposedly the first time. The second time they go look, they find his body. 
Now, because of that, um, it becomes an issue of, was he in the tunnel the first time when they searched or had he, was he not there yet and was then assaulted, beaten someplace else and then put in the tunnel later. All right. So, oops, sorry. Um, so the story then goes, so they find his body and they do the autopsy and they say he died of fell, fell, hit his head and drowned because there was a lot of water rushing through. Right. And so he was buried. And then the family went berserk and said, that's not, that's not what happened. And they had money and the other, other, everybody sort of had money. This is kind of a high class group of people. They started fighting to prove that he did not um, accidentally, this would have been accidental. Some say suicide just because he was upset and ran. Did he jump into the canal or, but it seemed more like he was drunk and angry and ran away from the girl who pissed him off and fell. That seems like more what it is. But if you watch the show, you'll find out that's not how it ends up. So these two girls, um, they were the last supposedly to see him. They get arrested eventually. And because supposedly, uh, yeah, they know more. They know more, these two girls. The one girl, maybe she she wanted to do them in. That's that's Laura. And then the, the best friend wanted to help her. See, now this is where the story falls apart. <laughs> um, she's, a, she's the best friend of the guy who gets killed, ends up dead. This girl is dating him, and you would think she'd be really pissed at her uh, because like, hey, if you, you know, you, 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 you upset him, you pissed him off and you're the cause of his death. I ain't helping you in any way possible. But she backed up her story. Why would she do that unless the story was what it is? But then things go on. The claim is, see, this guy, this is the ex-boyfriend, you see, of Laura. So they don't end up together, by the way. So they don't ever get married. So. But he's the ex-boyfriend. So then the theory comes down to that when the guy ran away, she called her ex-boyfriend or he was actually stalking her and saw her with El Negro and was pissed off. So he went after them with his buddies and they beat the crap out of him. And then they put him in the back of their vehicle, took him someplace, and then later on dumped him in the canal. And that's why he wasn't found the first time, you see. Okay. And the second choice is that she had some, she had bodyguards that actually didn't see that they were actually there at the time, but she called somebody and, and their dad sent the bodyguards over to beat up El Negro because he pissed her off or something. It's just, just they're students, you know what I mean? So, but it's not like, you know, this was, this was, this was not a, a cartel documentary. These are just some students and that the bodyguards kicked the crap out of, of Luis and then hid him someplace and then dumped him in the canal. So this does go. This goes too, all the way up to the Supreme Court of Justice located in the Palace of Justice pictured above here in Bogota. Woo, you know, um, eventually they do it. They do a second autopsy, by the way. The second autopsy, the family gets a second autopsy done. The second autopsy comes up with more damage to his body, you see. And that's why they said that he was beaten up. But apparently those were just damages from the first autopsy. And the autopsy did show he had water in his lungs. So he drowned in the culvert. He didn't get beaten up, taken someplace else where he died, and then put back in the culvert to like 12 hours later, he wouldn't have had water in his lungs. So all of this is such nonsense. Um, he may not be a great guy. I don't know. Maybe she's not a great girl. Who knows? But the clue to me here is that his best friend, Jenny, is not going to back Laura if she got his her her friend killed. So it's, it's really, it's crazy, but it's gone on for years and years. And on top of that, there's claims that the Comanares family, um, that they, um, not only did they they say that, oh, you know, this, 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 uh, this guy was involved, but they actually paid people to claim they saw him beating him up. So they paid witnesses. And so there's a whole, there's a whole squirrely stuff going on here. Like, like you wouldn't believe. So, um, but I can't come up with anything more than this is, this is a tragic accident. And 
Those two girls, oh my God, they got raked over the coals. They got their man, their lives are pretty. They, I'm surprised they even they eventually did carry on, but they had their lives kind of destroyed because they were like tabloid, you know, tabloid fodder forever. And uh, and as they as was pointed out, the girl. Um, the, the girlfriend was quite hot and, you know, so she was like the femme fatale. She was the cause of everything that went wrong here. And so people killed for her, killed her, you know, this Louise just because of her. And, you know, oh my goodness, it was just, it's, it's crazy. So it's a really interesting show to watch on, um, on Netflix. Uh, let me pull it up again so you can see the name of it. Um, it was called Crime Diaries Night Out. Uh, I found that one just, just to watch the machinations that went on. Uh, the amount of money that went into the lawyers and the way the lawyers fought from the prosecutor had some corruption issues and then the defense wasn't so great. So you have all kinds of crazy stuff going on here. And, and, and so it's fascinating to watch how something that could have been probably pretty simple, but because the family wouldn't accept it and because they could encourage this kind of you know, continued investigation, continued claims and pay for lawyers and maybe pay for witnesses, although that's I'm not saying that's true, um, that and everybody was out to get something. The media was out to get something. The prosecutor wanted to make a name for himself. Everybody wanted a piece of the action. And in in the middle of that, two young women and and, and the ex-boyfriend you know, paid a lot of the price for for being used for everybody else's, um, you know, all their needs. So in the long run, uh, so I'll talk about, you know, get your comments on the last case as well. That's why I said I did, I did want to put these two together because so much similarities in them. And in this case, I think she, there's clear cut issues. In his case, I think it was just, I don't know that he had made many issues, but he could have been just very frustrated that night, thought he had a girlfriend, got his little heart broken um, and was drunk. And I've always pointed out drunk, Men, drunk young men in water are not a good combo because we have a lot of men end up in the water, um, in a river, in a lake after they've been drinking. Sometimes just go, so they go to pee there. Sometimes they try to swim across a lake when they can't. Um, sometimes they just fall in um, because they're not in control of their bodies. They have a lot of energy and anger and frustration. And I think he just ran and didn't realize that the damn culvert was there. And that, that's, you know, that was a pretty steep culvert. And if he lost his balance and cracked his head on that culvert, he'd be unconscious when he hit the bottom. And it was overflowing with water. So first of all, he drowned. And then the issue of his body moving down the culvert was very possible because water does move bodies. It just does a pretty good job of that. And there was a place, uh, originally when the firefighters went in, supposedly looked in there, there was like a dip in the area where his body could have sunk into and they just didn't see it from either end. And later on, they found it. Um, but there is just really no evidence that anybody um, killed him. Um, it's just a really sad case because he looked like he had a great deal of promise. And so did she. And, you know, it's, it's, a, you know, it's so hard for any family to accept that somebody they love, their child, had a whole life ahead of them. And then on one stupid night, because that's what it is, one stupid night, one stupid moment, or maybe there are some things that build up to it, but they could have been okay. They could have been if they'd just gotten through maybe another month, they would have been fine. It's really sad, really super sad. So let me see what you have to say. Um, uh, um, if the water was cold, he could have gasped and inhaled water and drowned quickly. People can go under once and never come back up. That is very true. I mean, you know, it, you know, when, when water gets in, you know, your throat just closes up. Um, it's, it's, it, they, some of this they call dry drowning, though it's not quite accurate. But, um, yeah, and also if he hit his head, he just may say, he may simply be unconscious. And once you're unconscious, you can't, you, you, can't, you can't get up. So you're breathing water in and you can't fight it. And it, it go, it's over really quickly. So you have to be very careful about all bodies of water for that reason. Because um, when, I was, um, uh, when I was trying to learn to scuba dive, um, Good God, I sucked at it. Um, I, I was going to Egypt to be in the uh, Cleopatra documentary, and they wanted me to swim down to the ruins at the Alexandria site in, uh, in, in Egypt. And um, so I was supposed to learn how to scuba dive. Well, I'm not a great swimmer to begin with. I do I do snorkeling, which is fine because I'm on top of the water. 
Um, I tried, I swear to God, but they had this thing where you have to take the mask off and you have to let's see, take the mask off and breathe through just the tube thingy. And I am apparently a nose breather or whatever. So when I took the mask off, immediately water just flooded my lungs. And I was in a pool when I was learning this. And my God, the, the amount of time to go from the bottom of the pool, which was what, I don't know, you know, it's the deep end of the pool, right? Up to the surface while you can't breathe and you're choking to death is horrifying. And I did this a couple of times and then I said, you know, I'm done. <laughs> I, clearly this is not for me. Can't do it. But now imagine you're unconscious or you're being pushed along the water. You, you can't, you can't gain control. And, and then it's too late. I mean, yeah, it happens very quickly. So very, very sad. Um, and this is true. Water is extremely powerful. There are instances where a wave literally cut a ship in half. Very powerful. Um, and that's why, you, you know, you don't want to end up falling into a moving river. Uh, or if, you know, you're having one of these situations where uh, you've had a horrifying storm and there's a, the river's overflowing and it's going by your house. The last thing you want to do is be in it. Uh, because it, it, it pull you, it'll pull you under really quickly. So that's pretty terrible. Um, um, yes and no, depending on where you are. Um, some places it's not a big deal. Some places it's, and I think in today's world, they're making more of it than they used to. Of course, you know, you had the old days when, you know, the Spanish first came to the S South America, Central America, and it was more of a big deal then, you know, so there was a whole, you know, the whole history of <laughs> things that happened. Um, but there's a lot of places that have a lot of uh, variations in skin color and don't take it so seriously. Colombia usually is one of them, and so is then uh, so it's Brazil, um, for example. But yes, there are places where the lighter skin still has a, you know, has come through uh, the history of Spain coming and people with more power and money. So, and they've ended up on top. So yeah, but th you know, this was it's questionable in this case whether El Negro was was a, you know was a slanderous thing or whether it was just a sweet thing because again, this is something that's very common as as, a, as a, um, just a it's a nickname. It's just a nickname within families. So it's not like you're like a bad person or they're putting you down because they say El Negro. It's not. Or El Gordo, you know, big, a fatty, <laughs> flaca thin, whatever. It's just kind of what goes on. And I'm not there to judge. I'm mean, not part of the culture, but that's what I have heard from people in my Spanish studies. Um, but then again, you know, I don't know whether there was something there or not, or whether this is being blown up in the Netflix stuff, you know, sure. Uh, the Netflix show, you know? Uh, yes, Negrita is another one uh, uh, that will be female. Uh, you know, uh, female in Negrita. And any point of time you put Ita on, it means like small, sweet, you know, like, hey, little Negrita. It's a, not necessarily a bad thing. Oh, you're saying, my mother was Nicaraguan. It is a thing. Huh? Perhaps in Nicaragua. Yeah. <laughs> but I'm just pointing out that I don't know that um... <laughs> soy gorda. <laughs> So, soy tambien, <laughs> uh, I'm just pointing this out because they're using it as a catalyst for what happened to him. And I don't know that that's accurate. You know, just because she didn't end up, you know, just because a girlfriend decided maybe at that moment she wasn't ready for a relationship with him, or maybe she didn't find him as cute as she thought she would. Maybe she wasn't, you know what I mean? Who knows? Maybe she wanted to go back to the old boyfriend. So I don't know that race had anything to do with this, uh, uh, that he was slightly darker skinned. I don't know. It has any meaning at all. This was just in the movie. And of course, it, in the movie, they also show it being used in the court situation because you'll use anything you can, with, whether it's true or not. I'm just pointing that out. Um, so there's no, in other words, it was being used as a reason why he was murdered. And I don't know that, that there's any truth in that. So, um, but uh, two very... Um, uh, that I do not know, but again, you're, in, you're you know it's a culvert, and you you're falling down a culvert. He had a cracked skull, so it's not like his skull wasn't cracked. So it's not like he just drowned. He he had damage to his skull, so he obviously either he hit something with his head or somebody hit him. It's one of the two, but I just don't see any evidence that he was murdered. So um, again, it's um. No, it's um, it happens so often. I can't, I can't tell you how many cases of people have come to me with this uh, fam, a child has committed suicide or had an accident, and they absolutely will never give up the murder thing. 
they'll they'll go to the grace believing that child was murdered. And I just think it's a way to sh feel like somebody else is to blame, not just bad luck and not not some stupid thing your kid did, and you know, uh, or it's something that you did as a parent. You think you didn't do enough for your your child. You didn't recognize they were suicidal, or you didn't teach them not to drive at 100 miles an hour. You know, and hit hit trees. You know, you think you did something, you didn't do something right. Um, so the guilt, the guilt is huge um, with parents who've lost uh, children to tragedies like this. Um, and I, I don't know. You know, I haven't been there. I don't want to be there. And I don't know how I would react. I don't know if I do the same thing. I might. You know, I so I, I haven't experienced it. So uh, I might want to blame everybody and, and make. You know, and as a criminal profiler, I could put up a good argument for homicide. <laughs> I'm going to really could. Um, uh, so. Uh, somebody's you're boarding a plane. Well, goodbye, Sandra. <laughs> Hope you're going someplace good. Oh, uh, yeah. Anyway, so that's going to be it for today. Uh, it wasn't 20 minutes, as I told you, it wasn't going to be. Uh -huh. um, um, so anyway, I'm not going to get into the whole racial thing here, you know. <laughs> I, I've, I've got kids who span kids and grandchildren who span everything. So, oh my gosh, I'm so sick of color color of skin making making any damn difference. It's just like to me, they're just the way people look, and uh, you know, they look good. You know, all, all my family, even my ex husband, you know, <laughs> even though he's an ex, I think he's cute, and everybody's a different color in my family, from very very pale to very very dark skin, and so. I don't care. I wish everybody stopped caring. It's just a pain in the ass. I tell you. <laughs> so, uh, thank you, thank you, thank you very much. <laughs> I'm glad you like the show, um, and I do too. And I, you know, I say I've, I've, we've got someone in our family. We've got every every color. So it's just, it's just so stupid to me. It was always been even when I was a young person. It was stupid to me. I just never understood all the nonsense. Oh my goodness! But <laughs> um, but I'm glad you I'm glad you're here for t this show today. And I'm really sorry about these two young people because they look like you know what a shame. What a, what an absolute shame. <sighs> yeah, that's it's it's always just you know. And sometimes it's funny. I, sometimes I even think you know I want to support the murder theory just because I want the parents to have that some weird sense of relief. And, and then I, when I can't do it, I feel almost guilty. It's like, well, sorry, I can't, I can't back you. And I know that you want me to, and, and I can't do it. Can't find it here. If somebody finds it, you know, bully for them. I mean, I, you know, I don't have to be right. If somebody else really comes up with conclusive evidence because, you know, sometimes it could be something I don't know, something that, you know, if I'd only seen, I would, I would have a different, differing opinion. And again, this is an educational show, not a conc conclusive, I Telling you absolutely, this is how it works. It's I'm not like that's not what's happening here. So, but it's an educational show. I'm hoping I'm helping you understand things. And um, yeah, so I, April Fools to everybody. And good job on the one who said I had new pictures. <laughs> that was really good. I might get you for that one, but that was really good. <laughs> so I will see you at the hangout during the week sometime, and uh, see you soon. And if you haven't been to the channel before, like and subscribe, especially subscribe. See you later.